You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. When did you start getting the, the violent mindset where you wanted to kill people, stab people? He's in the back of the boot and uh, they, pull, they, they think they've killed him and he's still alive because he's making a bang. And he runs over with a knife and he starts sticking the knife in and it's making like a <laughs> sound like that. And I just remember my hairs on my head, I just stand up, I just remember feeling this like rush. And I thought, oh yeah, I wanna kill people. I thought I still had the knife on my hand, in my hand, and because I had the handle. And I come, remember coming back round and you know, when you see horror on someone's face and they're just pale white, like you know, when you got that color you get where you're gonna have a fight when you, your face goes pale. And they were all just, I just come round and they were just like, all in horror. And they were like, we're gonna get life. I went, shut up man, they went, you stabbed them in his head. And I went, I haven't, man, and the knife wasn't there. And I and they went, we're going to go to jail for life. And I was like, why, where did I stab them? They were like, you've stabbed them in his head, mate, all the way through. I was like, did I? They were like, I was like, yeah. I said, I promise you that one day before I die, I'll kill a police officer. And I realised the hurt I'd done, the bad I'd done. Um... Boom, we're on. Today's guest, we've got Shane Taylor. How are you, brother? Yeah, I'm good. Good to see Thanks you. Thanks for having us on, yeah. Thanks for coming on. Yeah. You were dubbed once Britain's most violent prisoner. Yeah. You had mindset of killing people, stabbing people, robberies, really struggled. You've put in segregation units, yeah. causing riots in prisons. But first of all, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. Yeah, getting there. Good, mate. <laughs> it's good to see you smiling. Yeah, man. Life good at the moment. Yeah, why? Well, yeah, there's obviously little bits and bobs that bother me, but mm -hmm. just I'll learn from them, help me grow. And then you've got your book here, Shane. Yeah, the true story of one of Britain's most dangerous prisoners. Um, where can people buy this book? We'll plug it straight yeah, away. Probably on Amazon or eBay mm -hmm. at the minute. Yeah, perfect. And the DVD and a DVD. Yeah, good man. Get it. I've just actually got into it and actually watched your documentary yeah, last night yeah. as well. Mad story. Yeah, <laughs> but we'll get into about it, brother. Yeah. Where you grew up and how it all began? Yeah, so, I, well, I, I was born in Middlesbrough and my mum had to flee from my dad and, and move into County Durham, Pateley. And then I, be, I, got, I brought up, got brought up there. And I just sort of like, um, I don't know, when, when you don't feel like you fit in with everybody. And my mum was married into another family. And so, like, you just, you do, you're not part, are you really? I, I know it might not make sense, but I just felt like the, the black sheep of everybody. Just never fitted in, never felt loved. And then sort of went down the route of finding a couple of friends who I fitted in with. And in the early 90s in the northeast of England, it was huge for joyriding, pinching cars, get the helicopter out, have 20 cars behind you and get chasers, hanging out the windows and that and all the estate would cheer you on. And that's what we did all the time. And, you know, because we were so young at the time, though, we only used to be able to pinch metros, <laughs> mini metros, because we couldn't snap them because they were too strong for us. So we'd just fly about in little metros and take chases and start burgling houses and, and just, um, we'd become what the police call an opportunist thief. And so you just go out and whatever you come across, you, you'll do. So if we went round the back of the shops and saw the back door open, we'd creep in and start grabbing all the boxes of clothes and stuff like that or whatever. Um, and I remember once, um, this is when I was really young. I got sent to a home because back in the day, they couldn't do what they do now. You, all they could do when you were under fifteen, under sixteen, they could just send you to like a um, like a foster parents or a home, like a and they sent us to this place in Durham. I met this lad from Bishop Auckland. We ran away straight. We I was only there two hours, and when we went to these shops, we went round the back, and they were all it was closing time. They were all closing the pizza shop. The back door was open. And we looked on the side and had this big, you know, the old purses you get, the old handbag things were open up, like outwards, like to the side. And we're like arguing, you go and get it, you go. And it took about five minutes and one of us went in, grabbed it, ran around the corner, opened it up. And it was about 10 grand 
rolled up. They must have just emptied the safe or something. It was about 10 grand, or 12 year old I was. You know what I mean? So you can imagine how much I was buzzing. And then I'd just been bragging that I was the best twocker and all that. I'd never drove a car at the time, but I was bragging because I used to hang about with all the lads who did. And he was like, oh, we'll go and buy your car. And my heart sank. I thought, oh, no, I can't even drive. And then I remember one of my mates saying to me, because I used to like jerk, and if I was pulling off and stall the car, and I remember my mate saying, just put the rev right down, just let the clutch off fast, and you'll just spin off. So I just saw, <laughs> did that, and every corner I come to, I was doing that though. Decided to go through the middles with the same my auntie and ended up taking a big massive chase all down the wrong way of the motorway and everything. And that was at the age of 12. So <laughs> so you can imagine the stuff we like used to get up there. Yeah, that was the start of that? Uh, no, that was not, that was just, the start was it was a, the start of it was a foam box in the swimming baths and we saw like a, it was like a, open a little bit and all the box where the money goes into and it was full of brimwell pound coins so we went and got like a, a screwdriver thing and popped it open took all the money got caught cried our eyes out and like oh please don't don't ring the police and he let us go and that, that was the start of what were you like at school Shane? i was a little um I haven't been diagnosed as being dyslexic or anything, but every time the teachers would sit down and try to teach me in any way they could, my mind wouldn't register it. And it just would not register. I would, I would, they would try all different ways. And I remember once um, the teachers, and back in the, again, in the 90s, it's different now because we've got all sorts of stuff and what they recognise and that, but at the time, the teacher was trying to tell me something and teach me something and I and I, I couldn't like I couldn't get it and, and one day he went, Well all the others can do it, are you thick? And all this class laughed at me. And at that point I was scared that I'd be laughed at like that again. So when I couldn't do any of my work, I would jump up and instead of like being in that position where the teacher's gonna say something to laugh at me so the class can laugh at me. I remember I would pick up a chair and just bounce it off, off the wall or I'd pick up a chair and chase the teacher. And it was my fear of being made a joke out of and laughed laughed at. So instead of that, I would rather just play up in, in the class. And so I just played up and played up. I got ex expelled from every school. And then I ended up going to a, a boarding school called Elmore Hall. And it's, a, it's designed for naughty kids, basically. And um, I went there and <laughs> I was expelled. Uh, at the end of that, they just uh, I was pinch I was getting the lads down to pinch the teachers' cars and everything, man. And the the teachers knew, and they were coming to me and saying, "Oh, do you know such and such from Peter Lee?" I was like, "Yeah, I do." He was like, "You've sent them down to pinch my car, haven't you?" <laughs> and I was like, "No, I don't know what you're on about." And I was just ruthless like that in that sense. What do you think made you into that character at such a young age? Was it your dad not being there, or how was your mum upbringing with you? Uh, not well. My mum's upbringing was more like a. Uh, if you run in the house when you're a kid and you're scared to death because someone's bigger than you and you used to think if they're bigger or older, the harder. And my mum's one of them who'd give you a clip across the head, chuck you back out and tell you to go and fight go and fight back. You know, as a kid, you don't if you don't want to fight back, you're scared. You don't want to fight back, do you? So I, I become a bit like I wouldn't tell my parents because I knew if I went in and said such and such had hit me, they'd be dragging me around and telling me that I have to hit them back. And I was scared though at the time, so I didn't I just kept everything to myself. And then just went through like um Obviously, feeling left out. Um, my parents being a little bit rough and not in the the bad way, like a bit rough as in like get out there and fight back, stuff like that. But the biggest thing for me is um, being bullied. So I used to always get picked on, const like at chased on from school. I had carrot ginger hair at the time, freckles all over. I was just soft, skinny, and they were just, uh, just everyone took liberties out of me. And then so it's... I remember once in school, uh, stood on my own and this lad come over with the group of lads like, oh, you can come play with us. And I was proper buzzing because I, so I went over on the play yard and when I went up and they're all circled around me and one of them just went whack and just punched me in my nose, popped my nose open and I just ran off screaming. And so that was what I was going through all the time. Um, and what do you do with that as a kid? Not feeling feeling like you're part of the family, not feeling like you're, you're left out. Just felt like I never fitted in. Wasn't loved, wasn't liked. Even though I was loved, but didn't feel like I was. Yeah, an outsider. Yeah, just didn't feel loved at all. When did you start getting the, the violent mindset where you wanted to kill people, stab people, yeah, was, you started getting a buzz for it? Um, How did that start? It Well, it started off with me just becoming a big game. Having my first 
fight back at about 15, uh, maybe a little bit older. And people started giving me attention then, like talking to me. And, oh, I heard you had a blah, blah, blah. And I was like, oh, yeah, people are look, looking at me now. And then so I was just getting game a little bit. And then I um, started to become mentally ill. And so I started to watch um, a film called Goodfellas. And there's a bit in, the, in Goodfellas where he's in the back of the boot and uh, they, put, they, they think they've killed him and he's still alive because he's making a bang. And he runs over with a knife and he starts sticking the knife in and it's making like a <laughs> sound like that. And I just remember my hairs on my head, I just stand up. I just remember feeling this like rush. And I thought, oh yeah, I want to kill people. And so I used to, this has got to be mental health, I think, because I would sit and we put that scene on over and over again and just watch it. Then my mates would come in and I'd be like, watch, watch, watch this, watch it. Oh, can you see it? Did you see it go in? And they'd be like, sat there like, all right then, Shane, it's been like 50 times now, do you know what I mean? Just <laughs> go out. And then I would just start daydreaming. Like I'd think, I want to kill people and that. I want to be... See, I had a twisted um, mindset of a gangster. So to me, a gangster's then, the ones in the background nobody knows about. They're not in it for a reputation. They've probably got millions and millions of pounds in the bank. And they really could get you shot like that if they, if they had to. I thought being a gangster was something like when you watch a two-pack film, do you know what I mean? Where you drive down drive down with your big chain on or, you know what I mean? And people just feared you. I couldn't organise a mm, tea party. No, I couldn't. <laughs> I, honestly, I couldn't. But I just had this mindset that yeah. if everyone fears you, it means you're a gangster. But it's not true. You're just an idiot. And 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 that's what I was, an absolute idiot, locked in this imaginary world of like, um, I'm a gangster because everyone fears me. People look at me and think I'm hard or I think, why not hard, but crazy. And uh, yeah, I'll just... <laughs> that's that's where it started, just watching bad films to try and get a bit of power, being bullied yeah. to then try to get fear. So how, when was the first time you'd felt that people were scared of you? Um... When did you get that feeling that, okay, this is what I want to do is drill fear into people? It was after I, I stabbed a man in the head. So I, I, I was in Artie Pool and was a man with a big reputation. And a lot of people fear him to this day. And uh, in fact, I think he's doing a life sentence now. And uh, he's well known for like running around, everyone's fears and walks and picks up Dale's houses, takes the drugs, I don't say a thing to him. Absolute psycho. He's been in and out of jail for stabbing people up all his life. In fact, he'd just getting out of prison because someone had um, <laughs> someone wouldn't serve him in the shop. So he walked out the shop, got the you know them big things what you do with the corn with, like the Grim Reaper things. Went in one of them, put it through his head, and got seven or eight year just because he wouldn't serve him. And that's how nuts he was. And uh, me and him come across each other, and and you know we'll not talk about our whatever, but we come across each other in the town centre in Hartlepool. Brought it to a total standstill. Uh, he pulled out. He pulled out a hammer. I pulled out a, a nine-inch kitchen blade. And he ran at me, smacked me across the top of my head, and as he smacked me, I stabbed him straight through his head. It sort of coming his, in his head there and come out there. Uh, knife handle snapped off, and I'd done one. Everything went black for me anyway. I can't remember it because I used to at the time when I had my problems. I used to. I just remember starting everything. And then people, I'd wake up, I'd wake up like half an hour after, not even know what happened or not. So what I'm telling you is from the depths and from the witness statements and from your friends who were there, because I can only tell you how it started. But what they said is, he hit me with a thing, I stabbed him, the knife handle snapped off and someone was shouting police and everyone ran. But I come round a mile away from the scene and I thought I still had the knife on my hand in my hand and because I had the handle and I come, remember coming back round and you know when you see horror on someone's face and they're just pale white like you know when you got that colour you get where you're going to have a fight when you, your face goes pale and they were all just I just come round and they were just like all in horror and they were like we're going to get life I went well, shut up man they went you stabbed them in his head and I went I haven't man and the knife wasn't there and I, and I went we're going to go to jail for life and I was like why where did I stab them they were like you've stabbed them in his head mate all the way through I was like, did I? They were like, I was like, yeah, buzzing. Because, <laughs> no, because that's what I wanted to do. So I was like, oh, yeah, Howie, let's go before the police come. And they were just in hysterics. Um, they were, their lives were over and I was buzzing. No, just 
So you had blacked out at that moment with stabbing someone in the head and then once you came round, you got an adrenaline kick as if to say, you've done it. Wasn't, yeah. What was that feeling once, you just, can you remember putting a knife in his head? Not on that one, I can't. But when I've stabbed, when I stabbed a different person, I felt it all, I felt it go in, I felt it come out, I felt the feeling. The feeling to me was like being on drugs, like being on ecstasy. It was... Um, and it was more, not the going in, it was when it was coming out. So when I'd stabbed him, the second person I stabbed, it sort of like went in his chest, in here, straight through. But when I pulled it out, it, it was like a feeling, like a... And, and, he, and actually, I remember it in my mind's eye now, like it was yesterday, because I remember I even saw the knife go in. But because there was no blood, this is what I, I, I struggle. I don't know why this happened, but I'd stabbed him, the knife went in, pulled the knife out. And then he was like, there was no blood. And I was questioning, I went to stab him again. So I thought I missed. I thought I must have went under his arm or something. I just, I saw it go in though, but there was no blood. And then I was stood there, went to do it again. And all of a sudden he just sort of went flip faint and he just dropped back. And then there was more blood than I can imagine. It was just like a tap. It's almost like you just had a tap on. It was just coming down the steps, just, just, just flown down. And I thought, yeah, I've got him now. And I knew. And then two lads jumped off the steps and they basically pulled out these knives. That, but there was just like little pocket knives like that. You know what I mean? I had a big nine inch kitchen blade and I was in the middle. So every time I was trying to get him, he was trying to stab me. And then every time I was going to him, so it's like a standoff. And then I, because he was coming forward, I don't know what he, where he's learned this from, but he was sort of leaned forward and was plunging in with me with his head forward. And I thought, I'll pretend to get him. He's going to come forward. Then I'll swing round and I'll get him in his temple. I'll get him in his head. And so I did that. So I went to get him and I just swung with all my might. Totally swung. And he just got back and it just slipped past him. And he went, sack that. He said, how we to his mate? He said, he means business him. And they both walked off. And everyone ran in front of us because I was saying, I want to kill you. I want you more than I want him now. You pull the weapon on me. Because it used to get me mad. If someone pulls a weapon on me, I want to kill him now. You have the guts and the... I nearly swore there. You have the guts and the... the or dosset eater, or whatever you... However you pronounce it, to come at me with a knife and try and do that. I'm coming for you. And that was... And everyone was like, just go, Shane. And I was shouting, you're all going to die. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just totally mentally ill, you know. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to die. I was... I was, I was at, they pushed me half over the other side of the mm -hmm. road and halfway down another street and I was still saying, I'm coming to kill you all and all that. How Just, old were you, Shane? At that point, flipping heck, uh, young as, I can't remember. I don't, I, do you know what? Because of, I, all I know is my life. I don't know my ages. I, I don't, all, I, I can give you a guesstimate, talking about 18, 19, something like that, I don't know. So a boy, man. Yeah, kid. Kid, but a mental, becoming mentally ill. Did you make yourself mentally or were you already battling from ages of seven, eight, nine, ten? Or was it once you got your teenage years being bullied, being vulnerable, is that what made you snap to be a psycho, basically? I guess there's things in my life, but when I look back on it, is is that part of mental health when I was feeling like I'm... Because people did love me, but not feeling like I fitted in. They rejected. And feeling like that all the time. Is that a part of mental health, what was just ready to grow? Because if you've got people who love you, you've got your mum and dad, you're in a nice home, you're not being abused or everything's right for you. So why are you feeling like that? So I, I could, you could say, because I'm not a psychiatrist, you could say that was part of something something to Check it boil up. off. Yeah, yeah. but I, I do think as a lot of the, the bullying, uh, people taking the mick out of me and just stuff like that was a snapping point, definitely. Because I just, I do remember when I had my first proper fight and I do remember like, I got to this point where I just thought, I'm inside, I'm sick of this. I've had enough of this. And I remember making this little thing in my head as well, which I didn't think was going to come true at the time. And, and, and I made a pact in my head and I thought one day, no one's going to pick on me again. Everyone's going to fear me. And, and I didn't think nothing of that but I used to keep repeating it. And then there was a point before I got game where the people who used to pick on me, and like, when you're saying people used to pick on me, I'm like 
12, 13, 14. They're like 18, 19, 20 odd year old, using you to get through the little windows and that for them and just scoring a grand or two and they giving you 50 quid and you're buzzing because you're only a kid, but they've ripped you off and mugged you off, really. But I used to, after so long, I remember being sat in his house and one of, there was two of the lads who used to pick on me all the time. And one of them jumped up and said, hey, I'll punch you, and I went, go on then. I said, go on. I said, remember, when I get older, I'm coming back. And he was like, what do you mean? I said, just remember, I'm not going to forget this moment. You won't do it again when I get a bit older. And the other lad went, he means it, mate. He means it, and he, he didn't do nothing to me. Well, that was like little things, and I just used to start, like, remembering. I'm coming back. And I used to just think that. This was before I really went on a one. But I used to think like that, and then and someone would do anything to me. I'd just say, well, I'm older, I'm going to come back for you. And that's what I used to do. What was the first time you got to jail, Shane? Oh, um, I was, you might not believe this, but I was um, 15, 14 or 15, and I was the first person in the northeast of England to get Section 50 freed. What's that? Uh, I, f I think it's that, or it might have changed, but a Section 53 is when you're under the age. The, 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 the judge only has a power to give you a certain sentence, so it has to be short two year or a year and a half or something like that if you get section 53 as a young offender it'll be changed now this is in the 90s that gives them the power to sentence you over two year and when i was 14 or 15 i got sentenced to a three-year sentence in a cliff secure unit and that was because <laughs> i haven't even mentioned this um i was burgling a house and i was carrying a knife a nine inch kitchen blade and uh the police started chasing us and the policeman set me up. I got in the back garden and he, he, he caught me and he searched me and he found the knife on me and he took the knife off me and he told, he, he made a statement saying that I, he had to restrain me. I pulled the knife out and tried to stab him. So I was like, just another hit, another more rubbish. So when I was on the interview, I was only a kid and I didn't realise what I was saying. But when I was on the interview, he said, uh, why did you try to stab the officer? I said, I didn't. He said, you, he said, you did. I said, I didn't try to stab him. I said, but I wish I did now. That's what I said. And they looked at each other. They went, you don't mean that. I said, oh, I do. And I said, now I hate the police for what you've just done. I was only a kid. I said, I promise you that one day before I die, I'll kill a police officer. It, it was almost like when people did things to me, I couldn't let it go. If it took, if it takes five year, 10 year, 20 year, 25 year. I could be a 90 year old man, still doesn't stop me being able to do that. So I think, I used to think, I can't let it go. And if people wrong me, especially set me up, I, 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 I become hateful, not only to that person, but to their profession. You know what I mean? You set me up now, I hate the police. I want to kill one of you before I die. And this is what I was saying to them. They were going, you don't mean that. I was going, I mean every word I've just said. And so I didn't realise they'll have been wrote all that down. That'll have been put somewhere, as in like a keep an eye on who he's going to end yeah. up being. What was it like being in prison for the first time? Uh, first time was scary. So I was in Aircliffe Secure and then uh, from that I ran away purposely so I could go to Diabol Prison. So I went to H uh, HMP Diabol, I think I'd just turned 15, 16, something like that. And I was petrified at first. Absolutely petrified. And then when I went on the wing, I heard a voice and it was like a lad I know from Pete Lee. And then I realised it was about 30 lads who I knew from on the out. And one of the lads had the wing boxed off. So as soon as I knew that, I was buzzing. And then I decided I was sick of that. So we had a, I had my first riot. It was only a kid and uh, there was this lad, <laughs> this lad called Stephen Russell. He gets nicknamed Beady from Sunderland. And, um, He's like that at the time, skinny as a rake. And we went round the wing up for a riot and they were like, half the, most of the wing were like, yeah, we're up for it. No, thinking we weren't going to. Well, Beady, he was like, yeah, I am. And he was the only game one who followed through. But it's funny and the reason why I'm laughing is you'll, you'll understand by the story. So I walked over to the pool table and the, the woman officer was playing pool and I got all the pool balls, put them all. She went, what are you doing? I went, this is the lad's uh, pool ball, pool table. What are you doing on this? Get, get off. She went, no. So I got me, my, my jumper, put all the pool balls in and started flinging them at the screws, started flinging them at the, the telly, everything, flinging them all over. All the officers have come, the ride bell's gone off. 
<laughs> little beady come running over, grabbed all of the pool cue, ripped his ripped his top off, <laughs> took his top off, and he went with the pool cue. Went, I'm an animal, and tried to break the pool cue over his <laughs> over his leg, and he couldn't break it. He's going, <laughs> and in the end, he just started swinging it and stuff. And uh, that was my first ever riot with uh, little beady, and then I got shipped out to a prison called Moulins, uh, HMP Moulins. No, I went to Weatherby. When I was in Weatherby, I ended up there. They were nice with me. And then one day, the officer come. And I said, I'm on I'm on servery. I should be getting £12 canteen. I said, there's only £2 there. I said, are you taking the, the PIWS out of me? And he went, uh, oh, go behind your cell. And he had a... Um, I'd just filled a cup up with boiling hot water. And I tried to fling it at him, and he jumped out the way. Went behind my door, barricaded myself up. Took my clothes off, put her all over, and just uh, started smashing the cell up and waiting for the Mufti Gate to come. And then I got shipped to Moulins. Then I got out. Uh, so my, uh, my prison sentences at that time, from 15 onwards, was like Long La- uh, North North Allerton, HMP North Allerton, Deobald, Weatherby, Moulins. And that, that was the prisons I'd been in at that time. Still young as well. I've been young, as many yeah. prisons. So when did you did you get a sentence when you stabbed that kid in the head? Yeah, that was lit. that was my last sentence. Mm-hmm. So I it, I was in and out all the time, remand a couple of months back out. Uh, but I'd be each time I was going to prison, I was getting more gamer and gamer and gamer. And then I ended up uh, basically it led to me being in the home house. I went to North Allerton, was ruthless in there. Uh, can you not remember the Bradford riots no. years ago? The race Brad- Bradford riots. Not sure. It, it's all, it'll be all over the news, but that happened. So loads of like Asian people and Yorkshire people came into the into the prison. But because there was loads of them, they started feeling like, oh, we're all together. We can take over, whatever. And I wasn't even bothered. I didn't even play pool either. So get this on you. I didn't even play pool, but people knew what I was like, and they came and got into my head. And they were coming over. It was like... Look at them over there. I think they run the jail because they haven't got the guts to do it themselves. They come to someone like me and get my head going. And I was like, and let them think as long as they don't come to me, I don't care. And then um, they were like, yeah, look at them. No, that was our pool table all in off. These lads used to be on their shame. What, we're letting them do that? And I uh, got into my head. I went, right, leave it with me. I'll sort it out. So I just walked over. I said, hey, you guys look at that pool cue. Cracked, smacked it, went tra- went for his head, but he put, he put his hand up and I snapped his wrist. But I jumped into the doorway, and when I jumped into the doorway, the officers didn't see me, and they all started battling with the other lads. They ran past all the lads that were fighting and come to me. They never seen me do it. I did it and got away, and they ran past them, dragged me to the seg. And that, you know, that was crazy. And then there was another lad um, from London, and I actually, I've later found out that he was meant to be a bit of a face down there, so I'll not say. But um, he come up, they got shipped out from a riot and they come up north and there was loads of them, these black lads. And um, he started running around. The, so in the exercise yard, the, what happens is we'll have all the Middlesbrough and all the side lads over there, all the County Durham lads. And they'll mingle every now and then, but all the main lads from their own areas stand together. So it was me, Pete Lee lads, and... Um, he just started running up because he wanted to ship out. Because he was, he started running up. There was about fifty Middlesbrough lads, and he ran up to them, going, Rrr! and they were all jumping back, all of them. And then he ran up to the Sunderland lads. He was doing, and they were all doing it. And he got the main. I just ran over, swung a couple of punches, and then I saw all the black lads jump up, and I thought, yeah, that's for me. And when I looked behind me, I heard someone say, "Oh, Shane, we've got your back." The whole of the prison was stood behind me. These are the ones who were all jumping back and would patting themselves they're all stood behind me saying i've got your back and then i went down the seg for that me and him he shouted some stuff out i said i'll see you on the on the back on the wing then went back on the wing and i walked past him and he sort of did a thing with his lip and when they do that thing when they were he did that as i walked past him and i had a metal tray they're not like this now the plastic but it used to be metal and i just turned around bounced the tray off his head and just started scrapping with them and the screws cut the, the screws didn't even restrain me because I knew what I was like. They went to him and restrained him and told me to get up nicely and took me off. What um, height in that were you then? What weight? Because you're a big guy, man. Was it six three, six four? How I about? wasn't. I wasn't as. I got even bigger. I was massive at one point. Oh. I was like ripped up and big, full of steroids, weird or mentally ill. But I'd, I'd say at the time when I started doing that, before I would say I was about 
16 stone or something like that. Mm-hmm. And I was just running around. Yeah, it's just, I don't know what happened to me to be truthful. I just, all I remember is I was just a soft person, started getting a little bit game. Next thing I know, I'm willing to kill everybody, like literally. Uh, and I don't, I'm not one of them, do you know? And I've always said this you do get a lot of people who carry knives today, but they're not willing to kill. And if they do, it was all out of fear. There's a difference. And that might not, it might sound crazy, but there is a difference when you have someone who is willing to kill and his whole purpose of having that knife is that he wants to kill and he does not fear one because I've seen people fight with knives or big swords and they're slashing at each other and they're slashing. If you, if, if they had an intention to kill, they just, oh, you only have to go over once and just go boom, straight in his body, pull it out. He's going to hit the floor because you've got his organs or he's going to die. So slashing the people and getting the outside of the skin for me is um, you're not intending to kill. You're just trying to put fear into the other people and stuff like that. Many people do you think you've stabbed? A lot. Yeah. I can't, I, I've been caught. I've been uh, what I mentioned is what I've been caught for, but stabbings and about. Serious ones, about 15. And everyone you enjoyed? Everyone. Loved it. Uh, I, I, I loved the, the for everything, the fear in the faces, the running in the people's houses. The only thing that really, really bothers me is an image I've got in my head, <clears throat> upsets me still, is uh, I had no, I didn't care about what I did and who was around and... I'll never forget this one image when I've ran, smashed in a house with someone else, ran in and knives the throats and the kid's screaming and the mum um, having hold of the kid in total fear. Do you know what I mean? Like total, total fear, the kid's screaming uh, and, 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 you know, and me pointing the knives, you know, shut the fuck up. You know, oh, sorry for swearing. Uh, and just absolutely, I, I can't get that image of the fear out of my head. Yeah, it must be difficult, especially at that stage, willing to kill. And if you killing somebody's kid as well, the fear that their mum and dad will also have. And it's not that I wouldn't have killed, I wouldn't have done that. No, but killing somebody's kid, if you stab a kid, it's still somebody's son. Oh, yeah, oh, sorry, as in parents. Like, yeah, 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 I'm not meaning stab like, the kid or the, oh, the parent. Right, yeah. So. And that kid, their parent, have you ever came across that kid that you've done that to? Because that trauma could potentially affect them their whole life. I've done it so many times, I don't even, I can explain. Half the time, the people you're doing that to, you don't even know who they are. And it's it's a matter of trying to be careful anyway. Why were you doing it? It's a matter of... Is it ta- well, you a taxing lot of people? Ta- a lot of the times it was me just doing it because I was trying to get a reputation. But when you're a bit nuts, it's a bit like a fighter. When you get someone who's rock hard, the local criminals love them. You know what I mean? Bit of money on the side, go and sort him out for us. But then when you've got nutcases and people who are off it themselves, they want to find the, the people who are even more off it than them to deal with them for them as well. So it's a bit like that. So sometimes on the odd now and then, now and then people will come see you. You're gonna sort him out for us, or even if it was just a close friend who I would have done it for now anyway. And it was it, it was all things like that. But the majority of the times was just for me to get my reputation and make people fear me. Yeah, there's always consequences yeah. and repercussions. How many different prisons have you been in, Shane? I don't know. I've lost, lost uh, count. North Allerton, Deerbolt. Uh, Weatherby, Moulins, uh, Home House, Durham, Brixton, Franklin, Full Sutton, Long Larton, Whitemore, Wakefield, Seg, um, and a few others. Were you just getting ghosted around, or were you just? It was mainly going from the dispersal prison, going round doing your rounds. Because once you're in them prisons, the top security prisons, they it's like you don't unless you. Get, you, they deem you're getting a bit better and safe. You can go down, but I was always in like Franklin, Full Sutton, Long Larton, and Whitemore. Then I went to Wakefield Seg, and they wouldn't put me on the wings. Then I would go to um, back to the Seg in Whitemore. I'd I did I just in years and years and years and years in the dispersal prison. It was just constantly in the segregation unit. Constantly. Were you happy in the Seg? Were you happy in prison because you were away from your own? 
demons, you, you couldn't hurt anybody anymore. What, no, was, what was, was going through your mind? Uh, just, it, it wasn't that I, I wanted to be on the wings and that, especially when you get TVs and that, and you can watch EastEnders and that, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I w- it was just, my mindset was set on this war with the system. I detested them for what they were doing and for how it all runs. And I was just constantly set on revenge, set on battling prison officers, set on being an idiot, set on fighting people when I could and and, and selling drugs and getting me canteen and getting extra stuff. Like, so I, can, I was getting steroids in as well. And just, I, that's all my mind was set on, really. I wasn't set on. In fact, I lost the set of getting out at one point. Didn't even care if I got out. To give up? I guess that's what you could say, yeah. Give up on everything. So when you stabbed the kid in the head, what was your sentence for that? So I got it, I got four year and nine months because the charge got knocked. So it was attempted murder originally. But you, 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 if you're solicited as a good job, you get you knocked down. So it went down from attempted murder and I think he got it knocked down to rather section 18 or was it section 20? Section 18 or section 20. And and I ended up getting uh, four year and nine month, and he and then what? Yeah, you didn't get out. You stabbed two coppers. Yeah, so that, two security guards. Yeah, so when I was in the prison, uh, in home house prison, I used to love my gym, and when I loved the, uh, I used to train, and they started taking the mick and not let me go to the gym, and uh, one day when they didn't let me out, I just knocked on the window to the officer. I said, "Why aren't you let me out of the gym?" He went, "Oh, what a pity," and I said, uh, "I want to get you." And he didn't believe me. And see, so my mates who knew me know that when I... Because I used to have a belief, if I say something, I have to follow through with it. So I used to go to someone and say what I was going to do. Because I knew then that if I didn't do it, I'd get paranoid. And they'd start going, oh, look, said he was going to do that. He's an idiot. He hasn't even done it. So I would do that deliberately. So I set a plan in, in, in motion and went out on association. Uh, I had a big, massive coffee jar about that big. And I went out in association uh, with it wrapped in my towel. And uh, I went up to these two lads and I told them to go at the end of the wing and talk to the officer. And I said, when it all kicks off, just stand in front of the gates so they can't get off the wing. And they went over, started chatting with them. As they were chatting with them, I went up to another lad and I just said, right, see the officer over there. I said, chuck the pool balls at him. And he had some problems as well. And I was like, he was like, oh, I don't know. I said, just go on, just do it. And got into his head. I said, once it all kicks off, I'll deal with it. So I went and stood up against the wall, and to his word, he just picked the pool balls up, started flinging them towards the officer. The officer got up to get off the wing. The lads jumped in front of the gates. He pulled his bat on, and he had no choice but to run towards the lad who was uh, chucking the pool balls. At this point, I pulled out the jar, smashed the bottom off, and ran over and just started slashing and stabbing him. And then another officer come, and I stabbed him as well. And that... um, different ball game then to the system so I was done for uh I think it was I can't remember what I was done for but I ended up getting an extra uh four year something on top of that as well and again that was the charges were got dropped down and would you ever when you says earlier would you just willing to die in prison or kill someone in prison where you'd have been in the system for your rest of your life yeah I lost I lost the feeling of love and care um a dark place to be in. Because it's, it's a mask, you see. I, I I just remember it was always a mask. I was always like this little horror, li- not a little horror, but this little soft inside. Didn't really want to do stuff, but I had fear, fear of like if I wasn't liked, if I wasn't feared, I had this fear of not being like that. And so I was, I was like scared all the time inside. So I'd put this mask on like I was buzzing and just super gay, which I was. But then I would just, I just, all I remember is the dark place I had that the, the mask was, is that I was in a dark, lonely uh, place, didn't care whether I got released, didn't care whether I got out, and just totally, totally give up on life. Like, totally. Like, death would have been a good thing. Were you ever suicidal? No. Nah. But I would put myself in scenarios that could have killed me and purposely. But I thought I'll go out like a I'll go out with a bang. This is what I, my mind's like. Death is good, but I'll do it right, not cowardly. I'll do it in a way where I'll I'll go on a rampage. 
and I'll start killing people and stabbing people up, all these gangsters or these faces, whoever they are. And then I'll I'll just go ruthless and let them kill me in the process. And I'll I'll leave with a, a big bang. That's my mindset. Which is crazy. So it's like suicidal, but not suicidal. I couldn't I couldn't try and kill myself. because uh, I used to uh, again, fear. If I did that to myself, then died like that, then people would be like, ah, see, he's 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 an idiot, he's a coward. And so I wanted to go out in a in a in a crazy way, in that way. So if someone stabbed me and killed me, it would have been a good thing for me at the time, and it wouldn't have meant not. It would have been a good. It would have settled what was in there. So how does the prison system? Because the prison systems <clears throat> treat like shit anyway. But to then stab two prison guards, how are you treated then in the system? Totally <clears throat> different ball game. What did it do? Brutality. Did it beat Setting you? Setting you up all the time. Constant. It was just you. You've got to be sane to. You. You've got to rather be sane or strong, because my mindset is strong. This. See, I've got this mindset right now. I went through five years of on a daily basis, brut brutality, setups, winding me up. And when he's saying brutality, I'm talking six or seven prison officers and right gear running in your cell with bodies on so you can't recognise who they are if you ever come across them again and beating you and beating you and beating you and handcuffing you, then beating you and beating you, choking you, you know, when they get your neck. And, and just as you think you're going to die and your body goes into a panic, letting go to let you have a breath and doing it again and doing that for an hour or something while you're handcuffed up and doing stuff like that. And at the end, you're still there going, come on, is that all you've got? You can't break me because the system tries to break you when you're ruthless. They try and break you down and then they come back and try and build you back up. But what happens is there's some people, they, they get so full of hate when you're trying to break them down that that's it, they're lost. I lost, I didn't even care if I got out at that point. I was especially in Franklin, HMP Franklin. I ended up in the, C in the CSC cells and that in there. Just battling them constantly. I just didn't did not care, and and I was that bad in Franklin that even when I went out on an adjudication, the, the governor and the judge was stood in riot gear and stuff. And I went, "What you got them on for?" They were like, "In case you attack us." I was like, "Would I do a thing like that?" <laughs> it was just a battle, constant, constant battle. Like one of the, the situations was, I used to go through a process. I'd stand on the back wall or lie on the floor. If I lied on the floor, I used to. Have lying on the floor with my legs totally straight with my hands up like that or they wouldn't open the door and then they would like um, the door would slam open bit of intimidation slam it as hard as they could and it would slap and then they'd put the shield into the doorway then they would slowly walk in and then shield onto me and then when the shield was onto me they would like tell me to put my hands off my head this is crazy this for a process just to go out and go on exercise and then and a man with right gear on that side, a man with right gear on that side, they would search me down, then they'd all get me behind them, then they'd pick the shield up, walk back to the door slowly, then they would tell me to walk, get up slowly with my hands on my head, so I'd have to bring my knees in, get up, and then they would, I'd have to walk backwards to the door, and then they would, once I touched the shield, they would step back so I could step out the doorway, touch the shield again, they'd tell me to go to the side, slam me up against the door, Again, same process, two right gear people, one on one, each side, search me down, and then they would sort of walk off me, and with about six or seven officers behind that shield, slowly walking backwards, and I'd have to walk backwards like that, all the way. It would take me about 10, 15 minutes, maybe more, just to go around the corner on the exercise yard, and then they started handcuffing me. So they would handcuff me, because I would still, still go off it. Then they would handcuff me with my hands behind my back, and do you know when you like put your forward with your head and put the hands through you. So they would have one on that side, one on that side, man with the riot get shield, riot officers there, and one behind with riot officers and riot shields. And I would, any chance I got, I would try and, and get them. Kick off. And once, I've never mentioned this, just to show you my mentality, there was one officer who was always in the front, but he would smirk. No, behind all them, not let them, know, but he'd be stood at the front, be going, like that to me, goading me and stuff. And then one day I just bit my hair because he had big baldy hair, like really shiny, you know, one of them ones. And I bicked all my hair off and made it shiny so I looked like him. And he come to the door because I pressed my buzzer. I waited till he was on and I could hear his voice. I pressed the buzzer and he come down to the door and he opened the flap and he went, hey, what have you done that with your hair for? And I smashed my face 
into the door window, pop my nose open. I went, because I like to look like my victims before I kill them. Like that. And then he, he just went white. And I said, don't go, because he went to go. I said, don't go. I said, come here, just listen to what I'm going to say to you. And he was like, what? I said, see you, what you're doing to me. I said, have your fun now. I said, but one day when I get out, I said, I want to come. I want to get you. I want to get your wife. I want to get your kids. I said, I want to get fishing wire. I want to stick the mouths, stitch the mouths together and the eyes together. And while you're watching, I want to pat you and I want to make you watch you. So I was saying, because I was, because of what they were doing to me, they were brutalizing me and doing stuff to me. And I was thinking, I'll, I'll get you back. And I was saying to him, I'm going to make you watch. And while you're watching, you're going to know it's because of you why this is happening and all that stuff in my head. And then I sent a psychiatrist to us. <laughs> and then I, <laughs> I had the psychiatrist come and I was like, didn't say a thing. I don't know what you're on about. No, just just a constant battle between them. And they're just as bad as you, though. That's the thing. That, you know, they're just big, not all of them, but majority of them that stick together. If, if, if one of the officers that attacked you, They'd all make a statement to say that you attacked the officers. They're all on the same side. And even if that officer's not doing the, the dodgy stuff to you, he's soon on his side if he had to make a statement. He's soon write a statement to say to, to protect them. So it's just them against you kind of thing. What was it like speaking to a psychiatrist for the first time? Oh, they'd, I've spoken to them most of my life. I, 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 know, I got sectioned off when I was younger. Uh, I went in the open bit, they sectioned me off for a bit and... I got restrained once off them, and then uh, they, they come and put me in a section, uh, the security unit. It was called St. Luke's at the time. And they put me in there because they said that I had un, un normal strength because there was about five bodybuilders all trying to pin me down, and they couldn't. It took them ages, and he had to get a, a needle and inject me with a needle, and then I woke up from three, three days after or something drunk. Lost three days of my life. Did you ever have... Visitors, friends come up and visit you, family. Family and that would come come and visit me. But again, in prison, what you learn is you don't have many friends. You know, you go to prison, no one writes. So they'll write for a couple of months. And then when the, the, the after they've wrote for a couple of months, they forget about you. Or maybe just when you've got a couple of months left, suddenly everybody starts writing to you again, telling you the problems and who, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I, I just, I, I, you don't have friends. The only friends, you have, the only people who stick with you is your family. Your close family, like your mum, your dad, people like that, but friends, none of them wrote. They did when I first went in, but then they soon stopped. Yeah. Who was it for your ma to come up and see her boy just becoming like the devil, just to yeah. want to kill and visualise and killing people and hurting people to, till he either dies or just becomes caged up like an animal the rest of his life? How well, hard is that? As a, pa as a pa parent now, I just can't imagine what my mum would have went through. It would been constant worry. She's told me she used to sit. But one thing I remember her saying is every Christmas when I used to be in jail, because when you're in jail, you think it's just you you're bothering. It's me in jail. I'm doing the sentence. You don't think about people outside. And she said to me, uh, every Christmas I used to go upstairs and I'd be crying. And I'd say, crying, what for? She said, because you were in jail and you weren't here and I wanted you here and stuff like that. And that bothered me. And then another time, uh, when I got out this time when I was changed and stuff, I was out about a year and I was stood talking to me, my stepdad and stuff. And I said, um, do you think I've changed? And he went, oh, you've changed. And I said, why tell me how do you think I've changed? And he just looked at me. He went, I'm not scared of you anymore. And I just was like, you were scared of me. And that bothered me. And that's difficult to be then, want to be feared of everyone, not realising your own family's becoming scared of you and fearful. I'm just an idiot. Simple as that. But a beautiful thing about you, Shane, the people will be watching this and the interview and thinking, man, this guy is off his fucking head. But the beautiful thing is you've actually changed your life. You've actually became a good man. You've actually regret your your sins and regret what you've done in life and you're trying to make amends and do good which is a beautiful thing brother that we'll touch on that now what was that moment then for you to then want to change to be a killer to want to kill people security not caring who you hurt when really you're actually hurting yourself but what was the day that you wanted to change and realize that you were mentally un Ill? Well, i was in parkhurst prison and um i started getting involved in uh, selling heroin with some people from a person from Gateshead and another person and then I put a hit on an officer 
the 10 bags of heroin. And it was a bit of a setup, but in that time while I was doing all that, this Christian come up to me called Robert Bull or Ronald Bull. And he, he started trying to preach Jesus to me and stuff like that. And I just went, get away from me, you plonker. I said, unless God visibly appears like you now, I'll never believe. But he would just go on. And then one day he said something and I just didn't forget it. And it was because I was confused. And he said to me, he, we were talking and he got me attention. He, was, uh, he pointed at his heart and he said, I've been in prison for years and years. I'm never going to get out. He's a lifer. And he pointed at his chest. He said, but I'm free. Now, my logic at the time, you're in prison. You're in a prison cell. You're never getting out again. How are you free? How, I just, now I think, how didn't I get it? But at the time I was thinking, how can you be free? What does he mean? So I went back to my cell and it would just bother me. I was sat on my bed thinking like, what does he mean? How is he free? He's in jail forever. He's never getting out. How is he free? What does he mean? And then he took these little white Jesus leaflets and then I ended up getting dragged to the seg for what I've just said. So that was the first incident of a little encounter with something making me think. And I ended up going to the seg for subversive behaviour. They were saying I was trying to use some authority um, to overthrow their authorities. There was a little bit of truth in it, but you know what the system's like. By the time they, 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 by the time they're finished with you, you're Pablo Escobar or something. When really you're just a little idiot selling a few things, you know. And then, uh, and subver subversive behaviour for that, and then obviously smuggling part of smuggling drugs into the prison. And then I, when I was in the seg, I went on a dirty protest, kicked off, and they, they just come, said, right, you're going back to the top security prisons again, you've had your chance, that's it, boom, straight back to the top security, and I ended up in there, is it Long Larton in Worcestershire? Ended up in HMP Long Larton, ruthless jail. And after a couple of weeks being in there, they opened my cell door, and they said, go to education. So I was like, oh yeah, buzzing, they must have been getting my education class. Went down... And just so people know the, the seriousness of this, especially in a top security prison, they've got what you call movements and they come to everyone's cell, gym, visit, works, edu no, every, and, and you've got to go to your destination. When you get to that destination, there's two officers with a clipboard and if your name's on the list, they'll let you through. And if your name's not on the list, they're meant to send you back to the wing. Now, if they you, were, you got through and you escaped... They could lose a job. If you got through and you weren't meant to be there and you killed someone there, they could lose a job. So it's serious. So I get there and I said, oh, your name's not on the list. So I made a fuss and I must have done their heads in because one of them stepped back and he went, go to the chaplaincy. And so I, I walked down to the chaplaincy, but I was just buzzing, thinking, oh, buzzing, I don't have to go back to my cell. So I went into the chaplaincy, walked in, and there was a circle of lads, um, basically watching this film of this old, like posh guy hello do you know and they, they were there and i just remember sitting down and i just thought oh no it's one of them mad christian things you know what i mean but i thought as soon as a video finishes i'll get off so it finished and before i could do anything the little christian woman was like oh are you meant to be here blah 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 she said your name's not on the list so i said oh, i'll go back and as i went to go back the, one of the lads leaned in and he went you get free biscuits and gattos and that. And I was like, oh, miss, can you put my name down, please? I'd, you know, strawberry gattos and chocolate biscuits and stuff in prison was like gold dust. So I wasn't going to turn that option down. So I kept going on for that reason. And I would go on the, this Christian course and I would argue and debate with them and, ah, you're all a load of nutters, you know. It's like an alpha course, it's called. A lot of inmates, uh, prisoners are becoming Christian through it. And I was just like, oh, he's, he's that's nuts. And then... And just to go back a little bit, you know, when we talk about coincidences, my cell door gets opened, but my name wasn't on the list. When I got to the other end, I was meant to be sent back to the wing, but they let me through. And someone pointed out to me, think of it like this, Shane. Where did you go and say that your name was down on the list for? I said education. Where did the chaplain, where did the prison officer guide you to? When he stepped back, he said, go to the chaplaincy. Why? Why open my cell door when I'm not on a list? Why let me through when I'm not on a list? And why would an officer who's not a Christian send me to the, the uh, chaplaincy? And I just see that as like, what, you know, people say coincidence, but there's many there, isn't there? Yeah. And then when I went in, 
And I just remember going on all the time. They had this day what they dedicated to the Holy Spirit. And when they dedicate to the Holy Spirit, they basically like just pray for you and stuff and things can happen or, or not. Nothing happened to me. As far as I see, a load of rubbish. All liars, man, you know. And then I'm making a cup of coffee and this chaplain, Eddie Baker, just come walk to the side of me. He said, I've never done this in all the years I've worked here, but God has just told me to tell you to come here this afternoon on your own. My motive, get out my cell, get some biscuits and some coffee. Yeah, all right, I'll come over. Goes to my cell, comes, uh, the, the officers go out for the break, they come back after two hours and then they open everyone up to go back to education, chaplaincy and whatever. Opened my door and said, chaplaincy. Uh, so I went back down and found him and he, took me into chaplaincy a bit and he got two chairs like this. He said, right, I'm going to say some verses out of the Bible. He said uh, something about uh, no one's righteous, not one. We all fall short of the glory of God. And another one uh, about Jesus dying on the cross for your sins and explained the Bible a bit. And then he just said, uh, pray. And I just remember thinking, what, what do I pray? What do I say? And he just said, from your heart, pray. And I just remember find, saying to myself, um, God, if you're real, do something. Uh, do something because no, if you're real, please come into my life. Just and I said other stuff, and I stopped praying, and we there. This has been over ten year, and it still upsets me. Because it was the start of the change in my life. That second. And I just remember sitting back after I prayed, nothing happened. And as I was talking, I started to feel like an energy feeling in my stomach and start to raise up and raise up and raise up. And it just shot up my body. And I uncontrollably sobbed and sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. Um, and I realised... The hurt I'd done, the bad I'd done. Um, and that, from all that, do you think that was a release, Shane? From you being a scared kid, knowing that you were doing wrong, but then wanting fear, to then that day has been a release of getting a better understanding of yourself and then understanding the pain because there is always that effect where your conscience becomes clearer it's maybe clouded or blocked and then you get a conscience where you understand shit look at the pain i've caused how is that feeling all i know is right up to that very moment i was still active in everything still planning to kill people when i got out and everything and then when that experience happened it, it it was just like I'd become a totally different person. It was just different. And then I had this sense of God's real. He's really real. You know, I have people telling me all the time, and I think whatever. And then sometimes I would think, well, if he is real, I hope one day he shows me he is. And and it was just an instant thing. So I, I can't sort of put it down to anything, but I'm prayed for. I have this experience. And from that moment on, my life totally changed. I was no longer seeing the prison system as an enemy. I was starting to think logically. It was almost like, honestly, it's crazy. It's almost like someone had just gone in there and just got a couple of them wires, what were loose, and just connected them back up. And suddenly the brain just went, ooh, all right. You know, it was that kind of feeling. And then I would just remember just thinking, wait there a minute. Now, I hate, I hate the police because they're arresting me and put me in prison. And then I was thinking, but I've committed a crime. I'm, I've committed a crime, so I should be. And then I thought to myself, well, I've been going through all this brutality and I hate the system for that. But wait there a minute, I stabbed the, the prison officers. What did I want them to do? Come and tickle me feet and feed me <laughs> coffee. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So I started to realise that my actions were putting me where I was, not everybody else. And that's the biggest problem with every criminal. It's never them. It's always anybody else but them. It's always the one who 
call the police on them outside so I'm going to get them back it's his fault it's always the police officer's fault because he arrested them it's always the prison prison the prison officer's fault because he locks the door behind when in reality it's your fault you're there you committed the crimes you want to run around ruthless so it's on you but criminals never do that you always put the blame off on the other people or they always like oh well I'm not in for that charge I'm only in for that charge and, I'm, and they always like justify themselves off each other if that makes sense. Yeah, responsibility is yeah. key to make any changes in your life, no yeah. matter how. So how does a man who people class as insane, people see as a threat, security, other prisoners, family members, and then saying that you've found God and you've found peace and you can see that you want forgiveness, do then people still think you're even more crazy? How long does it take for people to get an understanding of you that say, okay, he's changing? Or did they think it was just a scam to maybe get yeah. free cakes and biscuits and just another ploy to pretend no, that you're it, okay? It, it took years of getting out. When I first got out of prison, the, when I was in jail, the, the number one governor actually uh, made a meeting. Uh, they were that shocked that I was running around the wing as a Christian that... I remember getting the chaplaincy coming to me and saying, uh, can you come to the, 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 the gov number one governor's created a meeting for you? Will you go to the, um, come to this meeting? So I went in. I thought it was just going to be the governor. It was this table probably longer than this room. I had the governor at that end. They asked me to sit at the other end of there. And every chair was full. Social workers, probation, other, chap, other imams and other religious leaders, the head of uh, the police and the prison or security, they're all there. And uh, I walked in, sat down. I was like, hey, Shane, you're, you're due to be out soon, but we've heard there's been a change. And the number one governor went, um, do you have anything to say? <laughs> and I started preaching Jesus for him for about 10 minutes. I was going, Jesus is real, he's coming to my life and all like that. I was saying, he's really real, he's changed me, he's, he's in my heart. You just have got to repent and believe. No, I was just a new Christian, didn't have a clue. And uh, they must have all been planning, you know, one by one to ask me a question. But after me chatting away for 10 minutes about Jesus, he went to them, uh, does anyone else have any more questions? Or I went, no, you're all right. No, put their heads down. And then I ran on the wing with the Bible. <laughs> and because I'm known as attacking officers, I ran on the wing with the Bible and in the top security prisons on movements to stand in groups in case I get attacked. And I remember running up to the officer and I jumped in front of him. And they've all sort of jumped back as if there was going to be a fight and they've got ready. And I went, it's real. And they're all looking at each other like, I went, it's real. And they went, like, what's real? I went, Jesus Christ, he's real. And they all just split up and walked off and all left us. And it, it just, I can't even begin to even explain. How do you humanly explain what happened to me? It's impossible. I can't explain it myself. All I'm saying, I was just this weirdo. I had this experience and it's inst instantly changed me. And I was out within a year. Everyone was saying, oh, it's a blag. Oh, I'll be back in jail. And as the time went on over the years, the longer I was out and the longer people were saying it was real, the long that's when people started to come to me. Like my mates and that were like, oh, he's off his head. And then five or six years down the line, they're all starting to come to me. I'm really struggling. You know this Jesus you're on about? Um, how did he come into your life? You know, And it's like, all oh, right. You know, and I just found over time, you've got to prove yourself. And that's what it's about. Yeah, you can't expect us to come come out and within two minutes, everyone's um, like, oh, great. Yeah, he's changed. Come on, we'll all trust you. I think as time went on and the years went on, people started to realise it's not a, it's, he's not playing because he's not going to be doing it four or five years down the line. Now it's been nearly 13, 14 years. It was 2007 I got out. And I'd become a Christian about a year or so before then. So you're talking 13 years, I don't know, something like that. Mm. And so when the, as the time goes on, I think it was, um, tr and, and what I was doing. So the lad I stopped there. Every time I went into this area, I'd just never see him. He'd disappear. And one day I saw somebody who I knew when I walked up room in the club. I said, can you go and tell such and such that this is real? I'm sorry for what I did to him and it's real, I'm not playing. He went, I, do you mean it? I went, yeah. Funny enough, he left the pub. Within five, ten minutes, them two walk in. And he walks in, sits down at the table in the pub. And I sat down and I held my hand out. And I said, um, I'm sorry for what I've done. 
And he said, uh, takes a big man to do what you've just done. And he got up and walked off. And then, uh, so I was doing stuff like that to people, which was making people think, whoa. And then the prison officer, again, I start working in the prison in home house, the actual prison where I stabbed the prison officers, crazy or what. And uh, he was, the, the officer I was with picked the phone up, rang someone, and the door knocked, and they opened the door, and it was the officer I stabbed. And uh, he come in, and I just said, look, mate, I said, I'm, I'm sorry for what I've done. I said, I really regret what I've done. Will you forgive me? And he, he just held his hand out, and he said, I forgive you. Um, yeah. How's that feeling to people who you've potentially nearly killed to then saying they forgive you? Does that give you a bit of peace of mind? That It gives, it, it gives me a peace of mind, definitely, but... And I do forgive myself I'm, when I'm crying here. This isn't because I don't forgive myself and I'm feeling like I'm not forgiven. It's more of a um, just having remorse and feeling, you know, realising what I've done. And as I'm talking, the images come into my head. And so I, I know what I've done. I realise the things I've done. I, 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 and all I'm going to say is, this is just the tip of the iceberg. What I'm telling you is what I'm comfortable to reveal. Then nothing. And so I think... When you're talking about stabbing someone in the head and people go, ooh, I think definitely can't tell you the other stuff because if that's enough, I'll just reveal what I need to reveal in my life. And I know that when God came into my life, if he gave me at that point and I'm forgiven and I, I reveal what I choose to reveal and and that's it, really kind of thing. Do you get any medication or anything in the notion? No, I never have. I, I've never took it. I, did they diagnose you with anything? Yeah, I, I don't know if I've said, yeah, um, I was diagnosed, wait, well, I've had a few different ones because you seem to get different ones. But at the time I, I, um, I was diagnosed with paranoid, uh, paranoid delusions, um, psychopathic tendencies and split personality disorder. Uh, I was diagnosed with them three things. And I'll tell you where that comes from. The psychopathic tendencies and the par uh, paranoid delusions were. If me and you were walking down the street or, and you disrespected me, I would then see people around the area, and if they laughed, and it'll be only be laughing amongst themselves, talking. In my head, I'd be thinking they're laughing because he mugged me off, and I never did anything about it. So there's the paranoid delusions. They would get worse. See, everyone's laughing at you, Shane. They think you're a mug. They think you're an idiot, you're going to have to deal with him. He bumped into you like that and you didn't do anything about it. Oh, they're laughing. Look at them. Do you hear them laughing there? Then that would turn into psychopathic tendencies. I would then plot, start plotting the deaths, start plotting to kill one, stab them up, uh, uh, and it wouldn't go out my head and it would get worse. The longer I leave it, the worse it gets. And then I would just think crazy stuff. I'm going to kill them. I want to... I'll do this and do that and start looking in books of how to get away with murders and all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, like crazy stuff. Yeah. And, and my mind would just go off down that route and I'd literally daydream daily, like how I'm going to kill them. It wouldn't go out my head. And it'll, it, it, it's in the sense of like a matter of just the worse it gets, the more I want to do it. And it's um, horrible. So when people are battling mental health and a lot of people self harm, they're getting a the release. When you're battling these mental thoughts, your sort of your self harm is taking revenge out on other people. Yeah, and you would get a release. Yeah. yeah, that's the best way to put it. That would give me relief and 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 release me because it, it was almost like it's just pressure. I'd give myself on on like pressure in my brain. So if I leave things, I'd come to a point where I'd stop leaving things because I knew that if I left it, so I would deal with it on the spot because I knew I would suffer if I didn't. And it's like now, even even as a Christian, now I don't fear people. I fear my response to people. And I know I'm a Christian, but I'm human. And and I and I'd, 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 I'd 100% of change and it would take something drastic to, to get me to go down an, uh, another route. But... That's the reality, you know. How is that then when you start changing your life? You've made the reputation that people fear you, but the damage that you've done, does it ever, are you ever fearful that there will be a revenge because 
you have went to the other side? No, I, I don't fear people. Like I say, I, I, it doesn't matter. If people want to do that, they do it. So there's nothing I can do about that. I just hope and pray for their sake because this is how I look at it. It's them who's damaging themselves even more. So if I've hurt them, who's winning if I'm still bothering them? And so the message would be really for people is don't, just don't let it bother you. And if they're, if they're revenging, it's only going to affect them in the end. I can't do nothing about what other people think or do. I can try and give remorse, and if I see them, I can try and shake their hands, I can try and do whatever. But yes, I do sometimes have it in the back of my mind. What if someone does this? What if they plot that? What if this happens? And so it doesn't make me edgy, but it does enter my head a little bit sometimes, yeah. Yeah, it can play tricks in your mind, because you still get the old thoughts process. You maybe watch a certain film or hear a certain song where it can yeah. trigger certain emotions from. My biggest battle is um, pride, overthinking things, and uh, like if, if someone's mugged me off, I still struggle. Obviously, I can over, overcome with it, but I'm still a human being. Just because I'm a Christian, people think you suddenly become this super holy person with no struggles. No, I still have the struggles, but God helps me to cope with them, and I can overcome them. And, but I can, someone can do something to me, and two months down the line, I can still be thinking about it in my head when the other person's totally forgot about it on the same day. So that I still have battles in there, but I just I know how to cope with them now, and I know how to deal with them thoughts and no, not thoughts with them situations. So how do you deal with it, Shane? If you still get old emotions and feelings that do you still get those feelings that you want to kill or stab? I don't get the feelings that I want to kill people and stuff like that, but I I worry. I have a worry in my head, like if people come and it's on me. You know, like you're saying, what well, the people come back in revenge and let's just say 10 people turn up at my front door. How I respond to that is what I worry about. And I know what I'm like, but when I've got you, I, I know that I can let things go and I know that I'm, it would take something huge but to, to set me off. But what, I'd, you don't know. You, you can never know what's around the corner and when it comes to your family and needing to protect your family and stuff like that, how would you respond and what would you do? And I'm not fearful of anybody. Let me tell you that right now. And I don't mean that in a, there's no fear in there. I have one fear or keeps me right, right now. And it's God. If you take God away from my life, I have no fear. God's become that, oh, that control for me. I fear God. And so when I overthink things and think, oh, God, I'll do this, I'll do that, I have this fear that I know what happened to me in the prison. You know, people can say what they want, but I know God's real, I know he come. So because I know that, I have a, a fear of, you know, getting it wrong in the sense of um, going down the wrong route. So it keeps me on track at the minute, but do I wonder off in my mind? and think, sack this, I'm sick of people, I'm sick of this, people think I'm a mug, I'll show them. Do I have them thoughts at times? Definitely, uh, 100%. Mm -hmm. uh, I do get them thoughts and I do um, struggle with them still. I'm, I'm, I'm a, yeah, you're human. I think yeah. everybody gets those crazy thoughts of people getting pissed off, people hating their boss or hating an enemy and they'll get a thought, well, fucking kill them, I'll put them there or whatever. But the thing with you is, you'll back it up, so it can. Yep. It must be scarier for you that like, people will drive down and think fear. about other things, and we get crazy thoughts. I get crazy thoughts, but I was never to the extent where I would fall anything through. You just get a sense of relief of thinking of fucking punching fuck <laughs> out somebody or harming somebody that you yep. hate that's done harm to you, your family. That like, there is a good feeling from it, but then you go, you feel tired after it. But for yourself, it must be harder because you know you can go down, you can go that so extra it inch. Me. Yeah. I have that fear. I don't, like I say, I do not fear people. Honestly, I, I, I don't know why. I don't know if that's, a, is, that a, is that weird? Is that a problem? I don't know. But it, no one scares me. It does not. Someone ran at me and pulled out a gun. Now, shoot me. It does not fear me. I don't know what that is. I don't know if that's still a problem or not. I'm not sure, but I don't fear people. I, it doesn't bother me. What about speaking to somebody now? Have you spoke to anyone, psychologist? Well, I've, about, I've, well, I've been out. Of, I've been out of prison for over 13, 14 years now, and I've, I'm sound. How old are you now, Shane? Uh, Forty. Still young. Yeah. 
So what's your daily routine like now? Get up, school run with five kids, uh, come back, train, start a train again, go jogging, and then chill out, watch the telly, and then I have to pick my wife up, and then uh, go and no, do the school run again, and then go and pick the the wife up, and that's my daily run. How's um? <laughs> How do we? Where do you go now? Forward for the future. Now that you've been out 13, 14 years, you've got a successful book out as well. What's your plans for the future, Shane? I've learned not to plan my life out because you don't know what's around the corner. This might that sounds crazy, but I just take everything as it comes now. Uh, like all oh, that, just come my way. I don't go out. I don't care about money. I don't get no money from that. Why? Because I, I don't care. I don't. It's not about that for me. I know what happened to me. I know where I was in life and I was a scumbag and I was in a dark place and I was lost in a life what I knew I thought I could never get out of. And when I was in prison, I used to always think when I get out, this is it. This is going to be the time. And I really genuinely meant it. When I get a job, I'm going to do this. And then you get out and after a couple of months, you're with your old friends, back to jail again, sat there, what have I done? And it's just a cycle and you don't know how to get out of it. And it, two messages is no matter where you are in life, you can change and the second one is God is 100% real. He came into my life, and I'm telling you now, he changed my life for the good, and and, and I know. And I always, I almost have this, like, desperation in me sometimes. You now when you, you want to just get people and say, listen, it's real. Just believe me, because you're going to die one day, and then all these all the times you've laughed and joked, and it's too late. And, and it's like that kind of a feeling for me, and um, I just want that message out. You don't have to go down that route of crime. Yeah, and I don't care about money but to get that. You don't need money to get that message out. You know, someone else is obviously making a bit of money out, but I don't want any. I'm not bothered. I don't care. I've had a few people on that's been in prison, and same as people who's had addictions, they've turned to Christ and it's changed their life. I'm open for everyone yeah. to do what they want, as long as they're not harming anyone. If you're focusing your energy on something that's changing your life for the better, for the man that you were, then so be it, man. Go for it. For anybody that's maybe in the prison system right now, that's maybe too proud and think, what's this Bible bashing shit? But they're maybe scared or they can't get out of their method of thinking of hate and violence and pain. What advice would you give for them, Shane? I'd say just uh, learn how to just get away from that life because I'll tell you one thing I've realised and this is the biggest message. See your friends who you think you've got. They're not real. I'm telling you, I know they might say this, they might say they've got your back and they've, they, they, but they, they, it's not real. And what I've learned is, say you're a, you've got like a lass, and, a lass and some kids outside and your mate comes to you and you class them as a, your best mate. And he says, our mate, we've got some graft. How we let's go. Is that a mate? When he knows you've got a family to look after and he's putting you in a position where you can go to prison so you won't be looking after your family. And this is what I started to think like. I think your, your logic needs to change on what your loyalty is to people because it's just, they're not for you. They just they want you with them so you can go and do stuff with them and stuff, but they're not there. And when you go to jail, think about this for the majority of prisoners now. When you were in jail, how many of your friends who you grew up with are writing to you right now? I bet you it's your mum and maybe your auntie and maybe your lass. But how many of all your friends who you used to hang about with, how many of them writing to you right now? Not many. And I can tell you that now because they're not, they don't care. You're in jail, out of sight, out of mind. And you go in jail because you're trying to impress them. You want to impress everyone on the estate, you're a criminal. And then when you go in jail within a year, you forgot about. No one wants to know. Yeah. You know, and that's that's the only lesson I can let say because I don't think inmates will listen anyway. Mm. They're stuck in their their thing for Vibrant. now until it's time. But that's the only message I can say is just look at look at who's writing to you right now and you'll see who your pals are. And you'll see you don't have many. And when you get out and you go down the right path you meet people and you, you see different morals what makes you realize that mm. you were living a different life do you feel as if you get used a lot shane 100 percent. for example like i've just said i was <clears throat> no one would write to me for years and years on end a year before i'm getting out suddenly i'm getting all these letters of all my friends and family telling me all the problems and about how such and such went round and did this to them and i just started thinking you haven't wrote to me in seven years now I've got a year left. 
suddenly you're writing to me telling me your problems because they want me to get out, you see, because I'm known as being a nutter and they want me to go and sort the problems out. That's they're not friends. Why if you if they didn't if they wrote me all the way through my eight year sentence and fair enough. But that's what I just realised they're not your true your friends. Like one of my family members before when I got out, my wife fell pregnant and my young my cousin got done in. And he come round my house with a bloody nose and that I was like, Oh, what happened there? He said, I've got done in, how we come round, what are you doing for us? I was like, I've got a a, a lass who's pregnant. Went to the house, my auntie's house a couple of doors after. A couple of days after, she went, oh, how come you didn't sort the lad out? I said, I've I've got a lass who's pregnant. She went, well, I would have visited you, wouldn't I? And I just thought, you selfish. So, like, I'm going to leave a pregnant wife out to deal with it and bring her own kid up because you wanted me to go and do some of like that. And I realised then, I thought, even my family aren't even for me. They're all for themselves. And then when you don't have the reputation anymore, your friends take the mick out of you, your family take the mick out of you, they think you're a mug, and they no longer want you anymore. And that's why I realised they all just wanted me round because I was a nutter and I had a reputation so they could all use my name. And that's, so I dropped everybody out. Yeah, getting used, that's the scary thing is a lot, so many people get used and they don't realise it until it's too late. Yeah. But at least you've realised that, which is a good thing. You're still young to plan for the future. I know you don't like planning, but... Just keeping ahead and, and doing what you can do, live your best life. Like uh, it can be difficult, especially in this environment. Yeah. But fair play for your change, brother. Would you like to finish up on anything, Shane? No, just you can change. You know what I mean. And and, and I was the worst. It's it, it, I was described, and I'm not saying this to bag big myself up because I'm not. But I'm just making a point. As I was described as one of the most dan- the six most dangerous prisoners in the in the UK. Um, and for me to go from that to where I am now, if I can do it, you can do it. you just got to put your mind in, in, into it. You've just got to think, I've had enough of this, no way. I want to prove people wrong. I want to do this, I'm going to do that. And and just try and cheat, try a totally different life. Biggest mistake for me is wasting all that life in jail. When you finally want to change your life, you've messed your life up that much. You're not educated. You've never had a job. You give yourself a criminal record longer than your arm, so it's harder to get a job. When you finally do change, it's ten times harder for you. And so it's just, it, do you know what I mean? It's just hard. It, it's just, you don't want to be at that point where you regret your life. You don't want to be at that point where you're sitting there thinking, oh, no, why didn't I just do this all that time back? And you can do it right now. Oh, you know, if you're in prison, you can get out of prison and 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 decide on that day I'm not going back sack all this I've got my mum I've got my dad to look after and you know and you think of what you do to them uh, you know I didn't realise that my mum used to go upstairs and cry you know you think you're in jail you think of yourself but you've got to remember you've got a mum who loves you and on them special days when she's even all them other parents talking about their oh my son opened his Christmas presents oh and you're stuck in a jail and she's not seeing you how do you think that feels to them? Uh, it's crazy. And when I was doing this, and he's the one for people who love the money, is I was doing this course, and one of the questions they ask you on the course is, if you were to give your child a, a choice, uh, have £20 million on Christmas Day, or have your dad for, Christ, from, for Christmas, or have your daddy with you, which one do you think the kid's always going to choose? And it's always going to be your dad. So when you're stuck in jail for 15, 20 years, missing 15, 20 years of your children's lives, remember that they'd always chose to be with you. So as a parent, why can't you choose to be with them instead of taking your risks? And in your risk, especially when you're selling drugs, destroying other kids and destroying other families while you're at it, because that's another thing I... I disagree with you. I always hear your people on the streets. Sorry, I'm carried away. But you always hear your people on the streets, don't you, about criminal... Oh, I hate that baggage. He does this. Burgles houses. I would never harm a child. I would never do this to a woman. But see, drug dealers, you know what they don't realise? They do that every single day. Not directly, but they're doing it. Destroying families. Destroying kids and having a good upbringing because the mum's full of drugs. And destroying society... But it's okay because I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not directly doing it. But your actions 
are causing that. So you're hating bagheads because they're going around burgling and you call them scumbags, yet they're bagheads because you were putting that gear on the street to make them bagheads in the first place. And that's what, you know, anyway. But that's the loaded mind thinking as well, where you've got those mind, that mindset where you're ready to kill, like drug dealers have got that mindset where they're just willing to make money, thinking they, don't, they, they yeah. want to provide for their family, not realising the destruction they're causing. Yeah behind the scenes it's just that some people wake up like every drug dealer I've ever known people were active they never get anywhere yeah, and that's just facts I've spoke to the biggest drug lords on the planet some guys and they'll tell you the same they end up fucking skint yeah. like, you spoke earlier you wanted to buy gangster, but the real gangsters are the one with suits <laughs> that, are fucking, that are sitting behind the scenes making their money yeah. and like life is a weird thing but do you know what brother for coming on today and telling your story Shane oh, I thoroughly thanks. enjoyed that and I look forward to seeing what you do for the future yeah thank you God bless you brother right, God bless check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast thank you